Well, welcome back, Fellowship family and friends. It's always great to come into your space and share from the Word of God with you. I just want to say a quick shout out of thanks to all of you that pray for this ministry, financially support this ministry. We've got people that support this ministry that have never even been in our building, but you support. So just a big shout out to you. Thank you. Your generosity is so appreciated both in prayer and giving. Well, we're in Acts chapter 5. The church is newly formed. We're now months into the new church, and everybody is excited. There's people getting saved by the thousands. There are people being healed, people that have been uh, possessed by a demon, and they're being healed from that. So it's a very exciting time in the life of the church. We're going to explore the end of chapter 5 today, and I'm really excited to share it with you. So grab your Bible, a way to take notes, and let's jump into the pages of the exciting Bible. Come join me. Well, today, let me start with a, a very random fact for you to get us started today. Did you know that today is National Avocado Day? I, I love avocados. What an incredible fruit. Uh, my family likes avocados. But it's also National Show Appreciation to a Lifeguard Day. So here would be my suggestion. My favorite lifeguard is somebody actually on our worship team. They, they work as a lifeguard. And so Happy National Lifeguard Day to Amber. She's amazing. And I also want to say, maybe if, because we're always looking for ways to connect with people, to share the gospel, just a suggestion, maybe give an avocado to a lifeguard. So that's uh, just a random way to think about it. Well, we're in Acts chapter 5 today. Let's get serious. We're going to dive into the pages of Scripture. The, the church is just a few months old. It's an exciting time. There's already been three amazing miracles take place in the life of the church. The first one was a guy who had been paralyzed for over 40 years. From the time he was born, he's sitting at a gate. Peter walks by with John, and he is healed. He gets up. He dances around in everybody around Jerusalem, around Temple Mount. They're celebrating, man. They are excited. They've seen this guy for a long time, begging for food, begging for money, and now he's healed. He's able to walk. He's able to stand around, dance, and so miracle number one, this man is healed. But then the second miracle was the building began to shake as the followers of Jesus were having a prayer meeting. And so you see this incredible moment where the Holy Spirit shows up and the building shakes during a prayer, prayer meeting. And then we talked about last week, the third miracle really isn't an exciting time, but somewhat interesting because it's about... Ananias and Sapphira, two people that sold a piece of property, but then they lied about uh, how much they were giving to the church. They're saying, hey, we sold it for X amount of money, and now we're giving all of it to the church. They didn't. They only gave a portion, and they end up dying. And so you see it's the first recorded funerals in the New Testament church. So all of this has been set up by this amazing prayer ministry of the early church. They had had a prayer meeting. We read about it in chapter 4. They had had this prayer meeting, and as a result, as they came out of the prayer meeting, there was a new and unusual thing that happened. People are starting to get healed. Uh, we, we talked about last week, even Peter could walk by in his shadow. People were getting healed. People were being, uh, uh, that were demon-possessed were being healed, and so the church is now growing in size. It's growing in influence. Lots of people, and it has drawn the attention of the religious leaders. Those who thought that just months earlier they had ended this movement that was led by their uh, leader Jesus, they thought they had ended it by crucifying him, but now it has resurfaced under the apostles, the followers of Jesus, but it's stronger than ever because now thousands of people are joining the movement. But this one group of people, man, they're called the Sadducees. So wherever you are right now, just say Sadducees. All of our online say Sadducees. And somebody might look at you like, hey, what did you just say? And you can go, Sadducees. And that might open up a great conversation. It's the Sadducees. They don't believe in a resurrection, specifically a resurrected Christ. And so they're really struggling with this. They've actually laid the law down. You're not allowed to talk about this anymore. In fact, I want to take you back to something we read last week to start today. From chapter 5, verse number 17, it says that the high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. 
So what did they do? They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. Their jealousy stirred their emotion so much that they went, we got to end this movement. We got to stop what Peter and John and the other apostles are doing. So just put them in jail, lay the law down with them and tell them, look, you're not going to do this anymore. You're not going to talk about this Jesus anymore. That movement is going to end here and now. We don't believe it. And Peter and John, specifically Peter, um, He's observing all of this. He's the witness to it. He's the one feeling the effects of this arrest now as he sits in jail. And, uh, and he responds back to them, listen, you're not going to stop this sweeping Jesus movement. I mean, it's just too powerful, too strong. We got the Holy Spirit on our side. And so now Peter and John have this real sense of boldness. They're able to say what they want to say. Not to be ugly, not to be crude, but with a power that is a divine power talking to the religious leaders. And man, you can see the conflict is really starting to rage. And so months after watching Jesus crucified, Peter and John, the Sadducees are convinced that it had ended back then. But now here it comes and it's growing and they're empowered and that's where we're going to pick up today because they're going to be uh, in jail again. They've been arrested for the second time. Here we go, verse number 19. But an angel of the Lord came at night. So they're in jail. It's their second time to be arrested. But an angel of the Lord came to them at night. He opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Boy, wouldn't that have been spectacular? Then he told them. So the angel of the Lord spoke to the disciples and said, Go to the temple and give the people this message of life. In other words, take the gospel over to the temple. Verse 21, so at daybreak the apostles entered the temple as they were told, and they immediately began teaching. They immediately began sharing with every man, every woman, and every child. That's our theme here. That's our mantra. That's our mission here at the fellowship. We want to ensure that every man, every woman, and every child has a repeated opportunity to see hear and respond to the greatest news known to mankind that Jesus has died on a cross, was buried for three days, but rose again. He's alive and he welcomes you into his family. And so the, the, the angel of God has said, I want you to go back over to Temple Mount. I want you to start telling everybody because every person deserves to know this extraordinary message. So now here they go. Verse 22, when the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for one of the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. So they're assuming they're still in jail. They don't realize that an angel's come and open the prison doors. So they send somebody down to bring them up out of, out of the jail. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone, verse 22 says. So they returned to the council and they reported. Hey, you're not going to believe this, guys, but, and they said, the jail was securely locked, the guards standing outside, but when we opened the gates, no one was there. Well, when the captain of the temple guard and the leading priest heard this, they were perplexed, wondering, where would it all end? Then someone arrived with startling news. Hey, heads up. But the guys that you put in jail, those guys that you told not to talk about Jesus anymore, those guys, yeah, the men you put in jail, they're standing in the temple teaching the people. And there's an exclamation point there. So there is a ramped up anticipation here. Hey, they're over there teaching. You're not going to believe it. They're teaching in the temple. I, you told them not to, but they're doing it. And the captain went with his temple guards and he arrested the apostles but he did so without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Then they brought the apostles before the high council, where the high priest confronted them. We gave you strict orders, verse 28 says. We gave you strict orders, fellas, never again to teach in this man's name, speaking of Jesus. He said, and still, you, instead, you have filled all of Jerusalem with your teaching about him. When I read this, you know what my first thought was? Wouldn't it be awesome if Lake County, Florida, Central Florida, if the church, the fellowship, and other churches that are like-minded with us, if it were said of us, 
man, everybody in Lake County, everybody in Central Florida knows about the resurrected Jesus. Man, the church has been effective in getting the message out. That's what they're saying. Guys, you're filling Jerusalem. Oh, that we would fill Lake County. Oh, that we would fill our communities with the gospel message. I love this. And he said, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. Now, that's an interesting line here from uh, the council because just a few months earlier, they were very clear on their message when Jesus was on trial. You'll remember, and, and I want to share it with you from Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus was on trial, uh, this council was very clear that they, uh, they wanted to be reminded that it was them who was doing all of this. Matthew 27, let's just read it together. The leading priests, these are the same people that are putting John and Peter on trial and the other apostles. The leading priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas. Now, we're talking about something that happened months earlier. Jesus is alive. He's now on trial, the day of crucifixion. And they asked for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release? you want me to release Jesus or do you want me to release Barabbas? And the crowd shouted back. Now, that crowd, it was preempted by the religious community, the religious leaders, the Sadducees, some Pharisees. They're the ones that are planting the seeds. No, no, no. And they're in the back of the crowd. They're in the front of the crowd and they're shouting out, release Barabbas. We want Jesus crucified. Man, you remember how much hatred they had for Jesus. They wanted him dead. Now they got him. And so the crowd shouted back, Barabbas! And Pilate responded, because Pilate's got him on trial here. Then what should I do with Jesus, the one that you call the Messiah? And they shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him! And Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and he washed his hands before the crowd. And here's what he said. I'm innocent of this man's blood. I, you want Jesus crucified? I don't see anything wrong with, with what he's done. I don't see the crime here. I don't see that the punishment is fitting any crime. I'm going to wash my hands of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours, Pilate said to them. And the people yelled back. Again, this is the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they yelled back. We will take responsibility for his death. We, and love this line, we and our children. In other words, we're perfectly comfortable with taking the responsibility that we are the ones that are crucifying him and our children are a part of this. So Pilate released Barabbas, Matthew 27, 26. Pilate released Barabbas to them and he ordered Jesus flogged with a, a lead tipped whip and he turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. So again, we're talking just a few months earlier. These same guys are taking full responsibility for the crucifixion at the trial of Jesus. They're in the same temple area. All of this is happening in the same area. But now they, they don't want it to be known that that this is them. And so now they're trying to kind of worm their way out of it, and so Peter responds to them in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 by saying, Peter and the apostles replied to these guys, we must obey God rather than any human authority. I mean, this is a supernatural boldness that the apostles now have. So that begs the question, when is it okay to obey uh, God rather than our government, or when is it okay to disobey our government? There's two times that I can think of that it's okay for you and I to disobey our government officials. You ready? I'm going to give them to you, and some of you, you may not even like this. Uh, you may be like, oh man, I think there's more than that, because look at the way that we're divided politically. Look at the way we're divided in so many different areas. I really can only come down, I boiled it down to two ways or two times, I think, where it's okay for us to disobey our government. Number one, when the government commands us to do what the Word of God forbids us to do. 
that's one way, that's one time that I think it's okay to disobey your government. Number two, when the government forbids you to do what the Word of God is commanding you to do. I hope you see it. That's the only time I can find because the way that God has wired us, and we're blessed, man. We, we, those of you that are, uh, some of you online might be watching in a different country, uh, but we're here in the United States of America, and we feel very blessed. We've been very blessed in this country to advance the gospel. I think God has had his hand of blessing on this uh, country. Uh, and now with this new um, season in our country of so much dysfunction at the political level, uh, I just want to remind us that our permanent residence is in heaven, and we are under a command to follow the king first and foremost. So if the word of God uh, forbids us to do something or commands us to do something and the government goes against that, we should obey the word of God. All right, verse number 30, here we go. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. The God, so Peter's responding to these uh, religious leaders, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so that the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We're witnesses of these things and so is the Holy Spirit who is given, who is given by God to those who obey him. So now... Peter, once again, he's been preaching the gospel since the church was formed. Now he's standing in front of the religious leaders, the Sadducees, and he is sharing with the religious officials that every man, every woman, and every child has an opportunity, including you, even though you're a religious leader, even though you oppose us, even though you're responsible for the crucifixion of our leader, Jesus, you too have the extraordinary opportunity to repent and give your life and faith to Jesus Christ. Man, if these guys who were the ones crucifying Jesus could be at a position where they could repent, how encouraging is that for you and I? And if you've not repented and said, God, forgive me, I'm ready to give my life to you, I pray you would do that on this day. Don't wait another day. You know, as I was preparing for this, I came across, and I remembered this from years ago, and I thought about it in my preparation. There was a quote from, uh, from Penn Gilliatt. Uh, you'll remember this guy from Penn and Teller. They're a famous duo that do, does like magic tricks and card tricks and stuff. But he's a famous atheist. And here's what, here's what Penn said. He said, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. If you believe there's a... Now, he's an atheist. And he's saying to people like us, if you believe there's a heaven and a hell and that people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life. And you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward? How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and you're not willing to tell them about that? Pretty, pretty powerful from an atheist. Now listen, I understand there are people that are more extroverted in the way they approach others. I have a tendency to have no trouble speaking to people. I've got some sense of extrovert in me, but not everybody is wired the same. There are people that are, are introverts. What we're finding in the New Testament church isn't about people that are able to articulate. It's about people that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. So when you take that step of faith and say, you know what? I'm going to go across the street and talk to my neighbor. Now you're taking the step of faith. I'm going to go over, I'm going to talk to my neighbor. I'm going to cross my lawn, talk to my neighbor. I'm going to go down the street, talk to a neighbor. I'm going to spend time investing in this relationship to share the gospel. Watch how the Holy Spirit begins to empower you with the right words to say, with the right things to say. But now here in Acts chapter 5, because we need the Holy Spirit's power, we need that boldness. But this boldness that Peter and John and the other apostles have, the religious community, the religious leaders, they have become furious now that they've shared the gospel with them, as if you're going to tell us how to be in relationship with God. I mean, we are the Sadducees. And they are looking at Peter, they're looking at John, the other apostles with disdain. They have become livid over what is happening. It's interesting that 
in my experience, and when we read the scriptures, how often we can share the good news of the gospel and talk about the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, but so often lost people can find this offensive that we're approaching them. If you've ever talked to somebody that's anti-God, maybe they're an agnostic, and you start to share, they get upset, they, get, they, they push back hard, they want to debate hard. And here's what I believe. I believe that oftentimes those who resist the hardest are probably under a conviction of the Holy Spirit, and He's drawing them, He's convicting them, He's compelling them to see the truth, and they just continue to resist. So I want to encourage you, keep sharing, keep walking in the boldness of the Holy Spirit. Verse 33, when they heard this, the high council was furious. <laughs> what did they do? I mean, it's like repeat of how they felt about Jesus. They were furious, and what did they want to do? They wanted to kill them. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, who was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people, he stood up and he ordered that the men be sent outside the council chambers for a while. Now, Gamaliel, let's, let, let me just refresh your memory for those of you that maybe are students of the Bible. If you're new to Bible study, this is an interesting guy here. He is a Pharisee. Just a reminder of who a Pharisee is. Pharisees, the best way to think about a Pharisee is they're the guys that keep the Jewish law. They make sure people keep the Jewish law. They are the keepers of the Jewish law, which God instituted back in the Old Testament. But over the centuries, they are the ones who create laws to keep those laws. So now that law has doubled. Then they make more laws to keep the laws to keep the law. In fact, as the centuries go, they made more laws to keep the laws that were to keep the laws to keep the law. You get the picture. That's who the Pharisees are. Men, they are students of the Old Testament. They understand the, the, uh, the law. Well, Gamaliel is one of these, and he's highly respected, well-respected teacher of, of Jewish law. Now, his grandfather was a guy named Hillel. That's a, in Jewish history, that's a very famous theologian and Pharisee named Hillel. Hillel was this esteemed rabbi that uh, he had what was called Shmikah. He had uh, kind of the next level. He was a leader of leaders, if you will. And so Gamaliel is his grandson, but he also was known, because as you read through the New Testament, you'll find his name surface again. He's the mentor of a guy named Paul. So before Paul was Paul, he, his name was Saul, he was mentored by Gamaliel. In fact, Gamaliel said of Paul something very interesting. He said, I only have one problem with Paul. Here was his problem. He said, I cannot supply this man with enough books to read. I mean, that tells you Paul was a voracious reader. I mean, he just was scarfing it down. He wanted to learn. He wanted to understand. Paul was a theologian of theologians. And he's been mentored by this guy, Gamaliel, who stands up and says, listen, guys, send, the, send these followers of Jesus out of the room. Send these guys that are stirring you up and you've become furious. You want them dead. Send them out of the room. Let, let's just talk here for a moment, because if you'll remember, uh, as you read through the New Testament, Paul... Uh, he's not on the scene yet. He could have been. He could have been uh, around this scene, watching and observing uh, this happening. He could have been part of the council that was there, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, he actually said to, to Timothy at one point, and, and recorded it in 2 Timothy, Timothy, that, hey, Timothy, don't forget, bring my parchments, bring my books while he sat in jail. Paul wants to learn. He wants to grow, and he's been under the tutelage of this Gamaliel. And so his mentor, Gamaliel, says to the Sadducees, a Pharisee, keeper of the law, says to the Sadducees, verse 35, here's what he said. So then he said to his colleagues, men of Israel, he's very well respected, they're listening. Men of Israel, take care what you are planning to do to these men. You want them dead, I'm just telling you, man, I'm, I'm warning you here, be careful. Some time ago, there was that fellow, Thetis, who pretended to be someone great. And about 400 others joined him, but he was killed 
and his followers, they, they went their various ways. The whole movement, it came to nothing. After him, at the time of the census, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too. And his followers were scattered. So, my advice, coming from a Pharisee that you respect, my advice, Gamaliel says, leave these men alone. Let them go. If they're planning on doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if it's from God, you'll not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. The others accepted his advice. Man, they listened to him. They liked what he had to say. They may not have agreed necessarily, but they knew what Gamaliel is saying is the right thing. So they called the apostles. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. So they went ahead and beat them. Then they ordered them never to never speak in the name of Jesus, and they let him go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing. Now, they've just been beaten. They walk out of there. They've been imprisoned. They've been beaten, and they walk out of there rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, what did they do? They continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. How awesome is chapter 5? It, it, you're not slowing down the church, these guys said. You're not going to change. You're not going to persuade us. You're not going to shut us down. You can beat us. You can imprison us. You can threaten us that you're going to take our life. Probably at some point, they're tossing the rocks up and down going, yeah, uh, you keep doing this. We're going to stone you. And they said, you know what? We have seen our Jesus resurrected. We're going to tell everybody about him. And by the way, We've got an unusual power in us called the Holy Spirit. And man, I don't care if you're a Sadducee. I don't care if you're a Pharisee. I don't care if you're just part of the religious community or if you have nothing to do with it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to let every man, every woman, and every child that we encounter, we're going to let them know Jesus has died for them. He has risen and he is alive and he is coming back one day and he can save you. And oh man, these guys are empowered. So, Let's press pause right here at the end of chapter 5, and let's just talk about three things we can take away from this particular passage from 17 to 42, uh, those verses today. Three takeaways that I want to remind you of from this passage. Number one, obey the laws of the land. We live here in the United States, obey the law of the land, unless somehow it were to force you into a position where you have to go against a command of God that's in the Word of God, and, or God forbids something, then you need to follow God as a citizen of heaven. So obey the law of the land, but know that the word of God, uh, that we must obey the word of God above all others. Number two, share the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do the work. That's what you see in the early church. They're just sharing the gospel. They're sharing about the resurrected Jesus. They're sharing what they know to share, and the Holy Spirit is doing what only the Holy Spirit can do. He is doing the work. He is empowering. So they're stepping out in faith to share, and they're being empowered by the Holy Spirit. I just want to encourage us. Find those five neighbors, one on your left, one on your right, across the street, to the left, to the right, no matter what that distance is between you, or maybe you live on a zero lot line and they're right there in your backyard. Talk to your neighbors. Initiate relationship with them, and watch as a believer how the Holy Spirit will begin to empower you. Why? Because the third thing I want you to take away today is the church cannot be stopped. No matter what government says, uh, in, in the first century, they said, stop telling about Jesus, stop talking about the resurrection. So no matter what the government says, the church cannot be stopped. No matter what happens in our political climate here, the church cannot be stopped. So friends, I want to tell you, you are on the winning team. Jesus is the champion. We are on the winning team. He cannot be stopped. The message of Jesus cannot be stopped. In fact, some of you may remember years ago, a guy named Henry Blackaby wrote a, a, wrote a devotional book called Experiencing God. There was a line in there. I've repeated this line dozens, if not hundreds of times, and I'm reminded of, reminded of it today, and I want to say it to you. Look for where God is at work and join in. So friends, look for where God's at work. Maybe he's already at work in your neighbor on the left side of your home. And you just don't know it because you've not had that experience of relationship. And now it's time to engage that relationship. Let them know 
man, you go to the fellowship, you're a believer, and now let the Holy Spirit begin to do a work. You may not walk right across and knock on the door and go, hey, uh, could I just share with you that Jesus died for you? And he, now, you may, but why don't you just initiate the conversation and join in in what God's already doing? See, our responsibility is to share, and God's responsibility is to draw men to Him. And that's what the Holy Spirit will do. And so I just want to remind us today, look for where God is at work. At your workplace, in your school, on your ball team, in your family, in your neighborhood. Look for where God is at work, church. And let's just jump in and get involved. Maybe he's at work. You're going to go out for lunch today and you're going to go to a restaurant and you're going to have a waiter or a waitress that's going to serve you at the table and maybe God's been working on them. Maybe they've got a neighbor that's been talking to them or somehow they've been, uh, they've been being drawn by the Holy Spirit and you are the conduit that today may help them come to Jesus. You never know. So look for where God is at work and join him. Listen, friend, if you don't know Jesus, if you're online and you don't know Jesus today, ABC, admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus is who he said he is, and confess him. Say something like this. We confess in prayer. God, forgive me. I am a sinner and I know I am. I sin and I fall short of your holiness. But I believe that Jesus came to this earth. I believe with everything that's in me, I'm ready to exercise my faith by believing that Jesus is who he says he is. I believe he lived a sinless life. I believe he died on a cross, and I believe he rose again. And today, I'm giving you my life. Today, I'm calling on the name of the Lord. Please, God, save me. Today, July 31, 2022, I give my life to you, and I invite you into my life. Today, I want to be saved. Listen, friend, if that's you, and if you need to be baptized, once you give your life in, to, in faith to Christ, there's two ordinances in the New Testament church that you need to establish right off the bat. One is baptism, and one is communion, and you have that opportunity at the fellowship. And then there's other things that begin to unlock your spiritual growth, like giving. We read about that last week with Ananias and Sapphira, the week before with Barnabas. And so I want to encourage you to start the journey of your spiritual growth. If you know Jesus you've never been baptized, you can be baptized here at the fellowship. If you don't live in our area, we'll find a good Bible teaching church to help you get into. But I want to tell you, friend, I, I want you to become bold. I want you to take a step of faith and let the Holy Spirit do a work in you. Let's reach our neighbors. Let's find those five. Start praying that God gives us opportunity. I'm praying for my five that God gives me opportunities. I know all five of my neighbors right around me. I want to expand that but I look for opportunities where God is already at work to jump in and join him. So today, I pray that you are blessed by the reading and teaching of the word of God and that you will marinate this week on Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 42. Man, the word of God is rich. It is powerful. It is thought-provoking. It is convicting. And it is resourceful and helpful. So today, may we leave this place being enriched in our faith and if you don't know Jesus, that may you come to know Jesus today. Let me pray for you. Father, we close out this time of worship. We thank you for the songs that have already been sung in worship and the songs that will be sung in worship. We count it a privilege to worship our King, King Jesus. And today we talk about you once again as we are reminded from the pages of Scripture how the church was formed and what they went through to bring us the gospel. We are so grateful. God, thank you for men like Peter and John and the other apostles, the other followers, your own family, your brothers, that brought us the gospel. We're grateful. And so today, we say, as we close out today, thank you for what you're doing in the midst of the fellowship. May we be a church that is lit on fire for you. And may every man, every woman, and every child in our circle of influence hear of your great story, the gospel, that you have died but rose again and are alive and welcoming every person into your family. So Jesus, we say thank you today and we close out this portion of our worship gathering rejoicing just as the apostles did, that you count us worthy to share the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being a part of the online worship gathering today. So grateful that you've spent time studying the scriptures today from Acts chapter 5, participated in worship wherever you are today. 
I just want to say thank you. And if you've not started the practice of praying for us, would you start that today? This week, spend time praying for me, for our church, for the leadership, that God would grow our influence. And if you've not started giving, would you financially support this ministry so that we can reach into the circles of influence that God gives us with the great news of the gospel? Well, listen, if you've got a middle schooler or a high schooler, Encourage them to be on campus tonight at 530. If you want information about how to be a part of the fellowship, on Sunday the 14th, we're going to give some of that information called Growth Tracks, which actually begins all in September. We'll have an online track as well as an in-person track. So those of you that are wanting to be a part of the fellowship that want to do it online, we'll be giving out that information as well. I also want to make a comment. Uh, we were promoting for a while about going to Israel in March. We've made some changes. I shared it with you last week, and I just want to say it to you again. If you'd like to go to Israel, we're going on May the 20th of 2023. We'll be there for nine nights. It's an 11-day trip, the 20th through the 30th. But the exciting part of this new, uh, this new date for our trip to Israel is we're going to be there on Pentecost Sunday. So I would love to have you join us. Uh, May the 20th through the 30th, 2023, we're going to Israel. So come join us. It will be the trip of a lifetime. I'm so excited. So again, thanks for being a part of this community. If you need to get baptized, we'll be baptizing on the 18th of September. Uh, that's just in a few weeks. We want to gather everybody together to get ready for a big baptism that Sunday. And uh, just so grateful. So once again, thanks for being in our online gathering today. Have an extraordinary week. Go win your day.